So I finished writing the article for part 16. So I'm just gonna run through the article and cover what we are gonna be doing for part 16. So I've restored the project all the way back to just having two weapons, just like in part 15. And there are a couple of things we are gonna cover for part 16. So the first thing I wanted to bring your attention to is that a very kind viewer of our videos, he watched part 15 and he noted a couple of bugs with part 15. So the first thing that we are going to do is we are going to look at the errors that he's mentioned. So for the rest of you, right, if you'd be so kind to list the bugs on our comments for us, that would be fantastic because we can go ahead and fix them in a future part of the video, right? So that would be highly appreciated. A couple of uh, issues that he's listed. So uh, one and two are valid issues. Three is just because he forgot to remove the inventory manager. Four, I couldn't create a bug. I'm not sure what he's referring to. So in part 16, we're going to fix issue one and two. So issue one is basically if you finish off part 15, right? The code that we've created in part 15 made it so that if you fully level a weapon, right? The weapon will reappear in your level up screen, which is a problem. And this problem is actually caused by a very small bug that I have in the play inventory script. That's the new inventory script that we've created for the new weapon system. And the error is actually right here. So uh, if you scroll all the way down to apply upgrade options, you will find that there is this part here that checks every one of the upgrade options that we have. So it looks through all four of them and randomly selects either a weapon or a passive to fill up these slots with. There are two upgrade types. Uh, one of them is an active upgrade uh, weapon upgrade and the other one is a passive weapon upgrade. So for both parts, right, there are two modes of weapon selection. One is you select the leveled up version of the weapon and the other is you select just the base level of the weapon. So clearly if the weapon is leveled up, we will pick the leveled up version of the weapon and we will pick the level up two tapes and all that stuff instead of the, the base description and the base name of the weapon. What's going on here is that if we find that we already have the weapon that we are selecting, then we will treat it as the weapon is being leveled up. So then uh, if the weapon is being leveled up, so a couple of things are done over here and then uh, this sets the level up stats. So if the weapon is ready at the max level, then we do not get here. So then we do not set the stats for, we do not set the level up stats for the weapon. If we do not level up the weapon, if the weapon is not being leveled up, the code will actually come here. And then we will assign the weapon base stats. So the base stats, base description, base sprite, everything. So the problem here is that when the weapon is at the max level, we set some variables wrong. When the code comes here, right, is level up should always be true. So all we gotta do is just make sure level up is true. So that we don't spawn another copy of the weapon here. Because if level up here is false, then the code comes here after finishing the, the code on top. It comes here and then if level up is false, and then we will show level 1 of the weapon. So we gotta set level one, level up equals to true, and then we gotta disable the upgrade UI. So we gotta do this for both the passive section as well as the active section. So by setting this to true and then by uncommenting this part here, if you were to play the game again, you will see that the issue is now fixed. So it's just a small oversight that we had, or rather that I had, when I was coding. Okay, so in the article, it's pretty clearly explained the changes uh, and why the changes are made. And then, so just one thing to take note of, a couple of weeks ago, I made a change to the to the blog so that when you click on the, the code here, uh, it will copy everything. And then also, it doesn't copy the parts that are cancelled out. So if you don't know of this feature already, please uh, give, give that a try. Second issue is, again, is also pointed out by Autumn Maple. So he mentions that the garlic aura does not apply for level 1. So maybe let me just show this to you. So for the garlic aura, right, um, we can set the area of the weapon. So the area is basically just the multiplier for the weapon. So if I were to set, say, uh, the area of the garlic, say to increase by 2 for level 2, right, you will see the garlic will grow in size. So if we increase the level of the garlic, because the garlic's area is 2, total area is 3, so you will see the garlic comes much bigger. So the problem that our viewer pointed out 
is that the area, right, if you set the base area to be, say, 3, for example, it doesn't apply to the weapon, which is pretty silly, right? So the level 1 doesn't apply, and it's a really simple fix. So this is the line that actually allows us to apply the area of the garlic to the aura. So whenever the garlic weapon levels up, we have to modify the aura size. So we can't just do it during level up because uh, in our weapon scripts, uh, there is a function called on equip that fires every time we obtain a weapon. He suggested to just add the, the following line to the on equip function inside the aura weapon uh, to apply the area to the garlic. So this is a good catch. Uh, it's a very small detail, but it's an important detail nonetheless. So again, thanks to Autumn Maple for pointing that out and catching that issue. So just head over to on equip and uh, just have to apply and just type it up. The area of the weapon to the aura object. Let's test this out. I'm gonna set the base area set of the garlic B3. So when I play the game, and if I select the garlic character, the area becomes big right away. Okay, third one uh, is a strange thing. So if the character dies and the character revives, there will be an issue with the joystick and then you will not be able to play the game. This is if you've added the virtual joystick for the mobile compatibility patch that we rolled out. But if you get this bug, where if you restart the game and the mobile joystick stops working, you can just re-download the package uh, from the virtual joystick pack page over here. So as long as your version is the correct one, the error should go away. The fourth issue that we have is that, so uh, if we were to go around and hit enemies, right? You will find that when enemies die, there will be a error over here. So what is this error being caused by? This error is being caused by the code in our floating text. So in the floating text code routine, right, we actually do a while loop here. It basically runs every frame. Yeah, so this while loop, we will just wait for a frame, and then it will move the text upwards, and then wait for a frame and move the text upwards. So the problem here is that there will be one frame where t is greater than duration. So we want to make it so that in the event that the code routine stops, the text will still exist only for a short amount of time, and then it will disappear itself. So this is why we have a destroy here, and then we put a duration. So for example, if duration is 1, this means that our text, our floating text, can only exist for 1 second. So if the floating text exists for 1 second, and then our loop here, the last time the loop runs, if it's over 1 second, right, then we will have a case where the code is still running, but the floating text isn't there anymore. So if the floating text isn't there anymore, this rec will also not be there anymore. Then you'll get an error. Yeah. So just a simple fix for us would be for us to move the code all the way down. So basically what it does is that we are trying to offset the text first before we increase the time. If the time is the last thing to be increased, this ensures that our code will never run when t is greater than duration. So in this line here, there are two possible causes of the now reference. One of it is the wrecked object. The other one is the target object. So the target uh, in our case here is going to be the enemy. So when you hit the enemy, right, it's possible sometimes for the enemy to die first before the text disappears. So before we use the target position, we're just going to save it inside a variable. Okay, so uh, we will just check if the target exists and save its position. It exists and we will do... So here we got to declare a new vector 3, uh, last one. And then we will just set it to target's position. Just for convenience sake, all right. The target exists, then we will set the last position be equal to the target. This makes it so that if the target dies, uh, the last known position will still be tagged to where the target dies. So the text will continue to float upwards still. And then finally, we just set the last known right here. Finally, just as a fail safe, just to make sure that the now, now reference exception doesn't occur, I'm just checking that if the rec Okay, it's missing for whatever reason. So this is just uh, another failsafe to ensure that our code doesn't print now reference exception. Yeah, so no more missing reference exceptions. So there are still messages and there are still warnings. Uh, these are actually created by ourselves, so they are totally fine. 
Another problem with the floating tags is that if you level up as an enemy is getting damaged, the tags that pop up may block the level up menu and cause areas of it to be unclickable. This is because the floating tags is positioned right at the end of the canvas, so it will be drawn on top of all the UI elements on the screen. To fix this, we will need to ensure that it spawns as the first child of the canvas instead of the last. To do so, simply add this line to your generate floating text coroutine. There is also another issue where after implementing the new weapon system, weapons no longer show on the game over UI screen. This is because this line of code is removed from the player stat script as it didn't work with the new weapon system. Before adding it back, we will need to change the function a little bit in order to get it to work. After fixing all of these bugs, we are going to create uh, automatic character selection from the game scene. So one thing that's always bugged me about this project is that we were unable, if you were to play the game from the game scene, right? you just you just don't get to do it sometimes. And the reason for that is because you get an error, and the error is in the player stats, because the player stats doesn't have a player character assigned. In part 15, right, we actually added some code to use resources, find objects of type all, and find all character data files. That didn't really work so well, because uh, the resources class doesn't always work. For whatever reason, I'm not very sure how Unity handles their files. I haven't looked into it in depth, and to be frank with you, this was generated by <laughs> ChatGPT. So what I did was I just posted this code on ChatGPT, and then it just gave me a fix, and then uh, I just modified the fix, and then the problem was fixed. So the, the, the key crux is instead of using the resources class, uh, ChatGPT advised that I use the asset database class. This is a little, a lot more inefficient because it finds every file in the project. So it actually takes some time, especially if your project is going to be very large. It finds all the, all, all the assets and then it makes a list of characters. And what we do is that we check every file, we try to load the file, and then if the file is, uh, can be loaded as a character data, then we add the character data to the characters list. And then after that, we just pick a random character from, from the characters that we found. So because the menu scene sets the character, if we start from the game scene, the character is not set. So if the character is not set, over here, if the character is not set, then we just randomly pick a character to use. So there is an if unity editor here. Uh, reason for that is because we only want this code to run if we are playing the game from the editor. There is also this part here. So whenever you go into the game scene, the game scene will try and destroy the character selector object. So the, the menu scene will create a character selector object so that the buttons can assign the character to the character selector. But once you get to the menu scene, we want to delete the character selector. So to that end, you will have to go to the player stats. Then, uh, because if you go straight into the game scene, there wouldn't be a character selector object, right? So, when the when the player tries to destroy the character selector object, uh, there will be an error. And then we just have to make sure that this code doesn't run when uh, there isn't a character selector in the game. So, we just have to check the character selector. Log instance is like this. So, what this does is checks if the instance exists. Only if the instance exists, then we try and destroy it. And finally, if we were to run the game, we should be able to start playing the game. So now that it's done, let's move on to creating the actual weapons itself. Okay, so I'll just quickly run through how the garlic weapon works. So the garlic weapon basically consists, as we've mentioned in part 15, it consists of two scripts. The first script is the aura script. This aura script is supposed to be used for any weapon that deals area effect damage over time. So like the soul eater would be another application for this. And then of course the center water would also be able to use the aura script. So let's say the aura is here for the garlic. Yeah. And if an enemy stays inside here, or rather if an enemy comes inside here, and he comes in at let's say uh, 0 0.5 seconds. So if he comes in at 0 0.5 seconds, he's going to be damaged in this interval. 1.8 seconds, 3.1 seconds, 4.4 seconds, 5.7 seconds, and so on. So you'll notice that the cooldown is 1.3, right? This is why we get this interval. Another enemy, if he comes in at, say, uh, 0 0.2 seconds, these are his intervals. So you see, depending on when the enemy enters the aura, the intervals are different. 
So basically what I'm trying to say here is that for the garlic to work properly, it has to individually track the cooldown of each enemy. What happens is that the aura script just tracks every enemy. So what we do is that here we have a dictionary. So the special thing about dictionaries is that it doesn't use a number for an index. It can use anything for an index. It can use an enemy for an index. It can use uh, other game objects for index. It depends on how you set up the dictionary. So what we have here in the dictionary is we have an enemy stats. This manages the enemy's health, right? Which is why we're interested in storing enemy stats. So every enemy stat object will refer to a float. So because 10 different enemies will have 10 different enemy stat objects. So then here we're just storing the particulars of the enemy. And then this float here stores the cooldown. And then this is basically a list of uh, enemies to remove from the dictionary, which we will get to later. And what we are doing here is basically in every frame, we will just scan the area of the garlic to see if any enemy is damageable. But before we do that, we will make a copy of all the targets that are affected by the garlic. And then every second, sorry, every update, which is every frame, we loop through every enemy. And then we try and reduce the cooldown. If the cooldown is zero, what we will do is if the target is inside the target is to unaffect the ray, then we will remove it. I'm sorry, the target is to unaffect list, then we will remove it. Otherwise, we will reset the cooldown of the enemy and, and deal damage to the enemy. So what's going on here is essentially that first, when the enemy cools down, meaning he's ready to be damaged by the garlic again, we have to check whether he's still within range. So it's possible that he's not within range. Uh, so how do we check this? So we have also two functions here on trigger enter and on trigger exit. On trigger enter basically adds the enemy to affect the targets. And then on trigger exit though doesn't remove the enemy, it just adds the enemy to targets to unaffect. So what's happening here is that we cannot remove the enemy directly when you exit the aura. Because if you remove the enemy directly from the affected target, what's going to happen is that it's possible for you to make the enemy enter and leave the aura quickly to deal damage faster than the cooldown. So for example, right, let's say if I have an, an, an enemy here, if I have, uh, let's say my aura is this big, and then uh, I have an enemy that's maybe right here. So what I can do is I can just move left and right very quickly, and I can deal damage to the enemy faster than the aura cools down. So what this means is that when an enemy, when an enemy leaves the aura of the garlic, right, I will still have to track the enemy's cooldown. This is why when we exit, or rather when the enemy exits the aura's range, we will only label the enemy as being a target to unaffect. And then when we enter, when we when we enter the uh, aura's range, we will always add the enemy to affect the target. So that is, if the enemy is already not inside, if he's already inside, we just ignore him. And then the other thing that we want to check is we want to check whether the enemy is inside the target is to unaffect. Because if the target and if the enemy enters the area, we shouldn't be trying to unaffect the enemy anymore, right? So if the enemy is inside the area, then we will try and do targets to unaffect, and we will remove them from the array. So then inside the update code, if the enemy is marked to be removed or marked to be unaffected, then we will only run this when the cooldown finishes. So if the code comes here, it means that the enemy has cooled down the damage interval and it's still within the aura of the garlic or whatever object it is. When the cooldown finishes, we will try and damage the enemy again. After damaging the enemy, then we will try to set the cooldown back to another value. So I hope my explanation makes sense. So after we have set up the aura script, uh, the next thing that we will want to do is to set up the garlic prefab. So in the aura prefab, uh, there should be four components. Uh, transform, the aura, the circle collider, as well as the particle system. Yeah, so the, the, the animation is provided by the particle system. So with the garlic prefab created, uh, what's going to happen next is that you got to create the aura weapon script, which again, you probably created already in part 15. Okay, it's very simple, we just add the aura when the aura weapon is equipped and we destroy the aura when the, the weapon is unequipped. So, one instance of when the aura will be unequipped is when you evolve your garlic into a soul eater, then you will have to unequip the garlic weapon, right? Because it transforms into soul eater. So then you have to destroy the garlic aura when the uh, weapon is uh, unequipped. So this is why we have this destroy function here. And then on level up, what we do is we just have to update the area of the aura. That's really about it. So it's a bit different from the projectile weapon because it doesn't fire every frame. So you also see this line here that disables the update option. So next weapon is the whip. So for the whip, right, instead of being an aura, the whip will be a projectile. So first thing you'll need is to create a whip uh, prefect, which I have already created. So just one thing for the whip, right? Again, for the whip projectile, uh, there is a video that you can refer to to see how the whip was created. It has a particle system, a collider, uh, and a projectile component. Instead of an aura component, component it has a projectile component. 
So one noteworthy thing about the uh, projectile is that projectiles will also have a rigid body 2D. Again, this is because they gotta fly around the screen and they have to register collision and stuff. So you make sure that you have the rigid body as well and make sure that the collider, just like with the Aura, is a trigger. Because if it's not a trigger, it will start colliding with stuff and pushing things around. And then for the projectile itself, uh, make sure to set the damage source to owner instead of projectile. The rest of the settings here can just remain as uh, their defaults 0, 0, 0 and there's no auto. But one thing that would be uh, good for you to do is for you to duplicate the amount of uh, number of times the whip fully appears. Let's say I'm gonna go, go to do texture shade animation, right? So there may be some some instances when, when the game is playing very fast, right? You may not always see the full whip appear. So let's say if the game runs, first this is one frame only, right? So there may be times when you will get effects like this where the whip doesn't fully play. This is because either either your frame rate is too slow or just because your frame rate didn't align with when the big whip happens. But you want to have the big arc appear always. So if you find that your whip animation looks a little bit thin, uh, you can just go to your texture sheet animation here. Just make some duplicates of whip number zero. You can just move everything downwards. And then one, and then you just put a couple of frame zeros on your sprites. Then this will cause, you see that this will cause the this arc here to stay a bit longer. And then what you will end up with is you will end up with, with a big effect that will look more apparent as opposed to looking thin like in the screenshot above. So I think this is pretty important, it's just a small improvement on the particle effect uh, just to make the whip effect show up more consistent. So finally we have the whip weapon script. Okay, so the knife, right? Uh, how does the knife spawn our projectiles? The knife spawns our projectiles by spawning a knife in the direction that we are moving in. The whip only has two directions, left and right. So because of that, we have to override the attack function in the projectile weapon. The whip, uh, we, are do we are making it a projectile weapon because it uses the, the same cooldown system the knife does. So we don't have to record the cooldown system, right? We just gotta record how the projectile spawns. So instead of spawning in eight directions, you want the projectile to spawn in two directions. So in that sense, the parts that are different in the whip projectile or the whip weapon are actually the highlighter sections over here. So the whip, right? Uh, another thing to note is that the whip actually, when it spawns, it actually spawns uh, upwards. Do you see that? So we have, let's say we have four whips over here, right? You will see that the first two whips appear at the bottom and then the last two appear at the top. So if you have more and more projectiles, the whips will just keep spawning upwards. So again, I'm going to use my fantastic art skills to illustrate this. So you have a character here, well drawn, right? And then let's say I have the whip. First whip is going to appear here. Second is going to appear higher. It's just going to keep going higher and higher, yeah? So then we want a way to be able to represent this inside the code. So then our whip, uh, where does it start? It always starts where we are facing. So if you're facing to the right, the first whip always appears in front. The second one always appears behind. The third one appears in front, but a little bit higher. And then the fourth one appears behind, but a little bit higher. So with that, we have our logic over here. Uh, the code here is mostly the same, but then we have a little spawn offset and then spawn count. Okay, so we track how many whips have appeared and then we track how the Y offset. So we just want to push the whip upward with every subsequent spawn. That's why we have a Y offset. So then for the spawn direction here, instead of having the spawn direction be in 8 directions and using a last move vector, we only use the X direction. X is just left and right, right? So we convert it to either a minus 1 or a 1. Math sign converts it to either minus 1 or 1. And then we multiply it by the current spawn count. What is the current spawn count? Current spawn count is basically the number of whips that have spawned. So for example, if my spawn count is 1, I always want the whip to be in front. When the spawn count is 2, I always want the whip to be behind. So then this logic here checks whether the current spawn count is a multiple of 2. Right, because every second whip will face behind, right? So if, if this is a multiple of 2, this will be either the 2nd or the 4th or the 6th or the 8th and so on. So then it's always going to be minus 1 if it's a multiple of 2. Otherwise, it's going to be 1, which is going to be forward. 
So we multiply this direction here with this direction here. So for example, if the player is facing to the left, then left will be the forward, right? In this case, left is minus 1. So minus 1 and then if it's on the left and then this is the forward direction, it's going to be minus 1 times 1. This will give us minus 1, which means our forward direction is left. If we are facing to the right and we uh, this is our first projectile, this will be 1 times 1. So this will face to the right. So this is just a little formula to depend, uh, sorry, to determine where the wave should appear. And once we've determined where the wave wants to spawn, uh, we also modify the spawn offset. What is the spawn offset? If you recall, the spawn offset is when you create a scriptable object for the weapon, right? Uh, there is a little spawn variance here. Spawn variance is used in knife uh, because for the knife, uh, you notice when you level it up, we have some spawn variance. The spawn variance allows the knife to spawn roughly a slightly different place every time you spawn. So then you get the knives coming out, but coming out in staggered, right? They don't, they don't, they, they don't always come out in a line, and that's because the respawn variance. So for the for the weight we allow the spawn variances to happen and then basically again we just take into account the uh, x. So what we are doing here is we're making sure that if there is spawn variance we're only taking into account the x. So the y will not affect uh, the spawn variance. This is because the y is going to be determined by the width itself, right? So after we determine where the projectile will spawn and which direction it will face, either left or right, we can instantiate the projectile. And then once we instantiate it, one important thing is that you have to flip the whip if it's facing to the left, right? So your whip, when it spawns, it cannot always be facing to the right. You have to face it to the left. Uh, that is if the player character is facing to the left, right? So for the whip here, you can actually flip the whip by using minus one or one. And then when you flip it, of course, the collider flips as well. So the, the code for the spawn count is largely the same as the projectile takes into account what the spawn, the projectile interval is, and then it just spawns the projectiles one after another. The only thing that's different is that if the current spawn count is an even number, meaning that let's say if I'm spawning my second whip, the third whip is gonna have a Y offset that's higher. So then every time we spawn two whips, then we will increase the Y offset. That's really just about it. So in our case here, the whip is a projectile weapon that spawns a, project, a projectile that doesn't move. It just stays where it spawns and then it just finishes the animation and goes away. So once we've created a whip weapon, you will find that when you create a new weapon data, so let's say uh, whip, you can now select the whip weapon. Again, refer to the vampire survivors wiki for the full stats. Drop this into the description and the projectile will be the whip projectile that you created, right? So that, that will be under prefabs, and then weapons, projectiles, whip projectile. So you gotta refer to the stats and then from there you can construct the weapon data for your weapon. And then once it's ready and you have projectile assigned to your weapon, you will be able to use the weapon by assigning it to the player's inventory. So for the whip, the trickiest part is just creating the whip weapon script, right? Once you do that, it's just a matter of assigning the weapon data and then you can start using the whip. Game, before we save the game, let's just go to the inventory and let's add the new weapon here. Ah, so one thing I missed out for the whip, whip is working by the spawns on top of the player. To rectify that, we have to go back to the whip here, and then we gotta change the spawn variance to, to, to be slightly in front, so I'm gonna set the spawn variance here to be something at 1.1.1. So if I set this value to 1.1, you will see the whip goes away. So the next weapon that we have lined up is actually uh, the lightning ring which is right here. It's one of my favorite uh, weapons to create during the stream. Uh, I have the effect right here, but you're gonna have to create it yourself unless you want to uh, download our, our project files from Patreon. So you just gotta follow this tutorial. It's free for everyone. Just find it in our um, um, channel. Uh, once you create the effect, which we already have, you will have to create a lightning ring uh, weapon script. So, as usual, once you create a class, drop down will allow you to select Lightning Ring Weapon. Uh, it's a projectile weapon, same as the whip, 
and the knife. Why do we use a projectile weapon? Again, because the projectile weapon has two things. It fires a projectile and it has a cooldown system. So with the lightning ring, right, the functionality is slightly different from, from usual. It doesn't fire a projectile even though it's called a projectile weapon. So what it does is it just it just spawns a lightning bolt on top of the enemy and then it just damages the enemy instantaneously. Okay, so the lightning ring is simpler to explain in the whip. Uh, this is the same as the projectile weapon. So what's different about the lightning ring is that whenever it cools down, instead of spawning a projectile to fire, notice that we didn't create a projectile for the lightning ring. Yeah, we only created a heat effect. So for the lightning ring, once once it's cooled down, what we do is we just find all the enemies inside the scene. It's gonna be a little bit expensive, but we find every enemy in the scene, and then after that, we increase the cooldown, and then we set the current attack count. So for example, lightning ring, if you have say two bolts, then the current attack count will be set to two. So then it will strike twice, right? So then every time the lightning ring fires, it will pick an enemy, and then after it picks an enemy, it will call this function called uh, damage area. So what pick enemy does here is that when the weapon is cooled down, notice that the lightning ring has all selected enemies here. It's a list of all the enemies on the scene. Uh, when we get all the selected enemies, uh, what's going to happen then is that we'll pick one enemy and then we'll remove the enemy from the list. This is so that if you have one enemy only, the lightning ring will not strike it twice. Yeah, so we maintain a list of all the enemies on the scene and then whenever an enemy is struck by the lightning, it'll be removed from the list until the next cooldown. This example here, right, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to avoid a null reference exception. What is a null reference exception? Because when R is equals to null, I'll get null is visible. Yeah, I have a video about null reference exceptions in the channel. It's somewhere in the channel. Uh, you can. It's very useful because null reference exception is one of the most common errors that coders get. And it's very important to fix them because it means that a part of your code is not working. I must make sure the code doesn't get here when this is null. And the way I'm doing this is I'm checking whether R is null. So here we are saying if R doesn't exist, then we will come here. Right, so if R exists, then we will have to check against this condition. This is an OR. So this double bar here means if this or this. If R has something, then this will be false. Then we have to check whether R is visible. So this shouldn't cause any null reference exceptions. Later, we will test it out. And then in damage area here, what's happening is that, oh, finally I use overlap circle all. So once we pick a position to strike, we because the lightning ring actually deals damage in an area, so then over here, a function is created that picks all the enemies in a small circle around the, around the enemy, and then it deals damage to them. Whenever you do overlap circle, you have to grab the collider. Then from the collider, you can find the enemy stats object. And then here we check if the enemy stats object is found, then we do a take damage. Again, this little check here is to make sure that ES is never now. Because if ES is now, then you will get a now reference exception. Do note that when you do overlap circle, or you will pick everything in the radius, not just the enemies. So this is pretty essential because this allows us to filter out only the enemies because when you strike the lightning when the lightning strikes you will also pick other things like say the ground uh like treasure chest or like you know your own garlic controller and whatever whatever that has a collider will be picked um so i think that's it for the lightning ring weapon let's create the lightning ring uh weapon data lightning ring and lightning ring weapon here let's pick a sprite no projectile for the lightning ring uh no aura as well just a hit effect so we just have to Head over to our prefabs, uh, wherever you store your, light your lightning ring effect, the lightning strike, and then just put it under heat effect. And the uh, lifespan, I think we can leave it at zero, right? Uh, our lightning ring doesn't have a projectile, so we don't have to worry about the lifespan. Uh, damage is 15, area is 1. Damage is 15, area is 1. Speed doesn't matter really, because uh, no projectile. Number is 2. Uh, area of effect, uh, doesn't matter, cooldown is 4.5, projectile interval is 0.05. So if you notice the lightning bolts don't come together, one comes first and then after a short delay, the other one comes. Pool limit is how many projectiles can exist at one time. Uh, again, this is not a projectile, so it doesn't really matter, but uh, the equivalent to that is max instances here. Let's check if there's any knockback. There's a knockback of 1, and that's about it. So we can add some variance as well, you know, so this deals 15 to 17 damage because we have a variance of 2. Up to you if you want to add variance. And when we click on this, we should get a character with the lightning ring. We start click. And it's working. 
So with our weapon system, can you see how quickly we can set up new weapons? It's pretty cool, right? So it's no longer, you know, we gotta do up, do up a lot of prefab. Because the main thing we gotta do is just a script for the weapon. And then you just gotta set up the weapon data and then you are just off. It's just a very quick way of creating weapons. So as usual, so those of you who want to get familiar with the system, what you can do is you can try and start creating your own weapons as well. And if you are successful, I would really appreciate it if you head over to our forums. I'm gonna put a link somewhere in the video later on. Go to our forums and then just post how you created the weapon. It's mainly the script that we want, right? Because really there's not a lot of scripting that you have to do with this new system. The only script that you have to write really is the script for the weapon behavior. Our next weapon is the axe. Um, the axe will be the simplest of all the weapons. So the axe is supposed to I think in the update, they probably changed the behavior of the X. Uh, I'm not sure uh, whether they did because when I was playing the game in the past, right, the Xs, they spawn like that. So they spawn in a cascade like, like, like you see on the screen right now. Um, when I was playing recently though, the Xs were spawning differently. Uh, they were spawning, one was going forward, one was going back. So um, we're going to use the old version. Hope my memory serves me correctly because this this was what I remember before I played the game recently. I played the game for like 10 hours max, really. <laughs> but this was what I remember. So we're going to create this way of the X spawn. So for the X, clearly it will be a projectile weapon, right? Uh, so here is the script for the X. Before we uh, create the weapon data, we got to create the weapon uh, projectile. So for the X projectile, uh, it's a prefab. Right? So the X projectile is just a regular X. Yeah, you just grab the X sprite. Uh, so for me, what I've done is I've just given it a circle collider. And then because it doesn't matter what the rotation of the X is, right? Uh, I've just left it diagonal. But if the rotation matters, like for example, for the knife, uh, notice that I've put the sprite like that. So the default the rotation of the knife sprite is actually 45 degrees, but I've made sure to align it to the right because if the alignment of the weapon matters, you always have to face the weapon to the right. So in most engines, the right direction, which is this direction, will be zero degrees. Yeah, but because for the X, it just rotates around, doesn't really matter where it's facing. So I didn't bother to modify the rotation of the X to make it face to the right. So I just added a circle collider and then it just flies around and, and then it just lands. If it lands on something, then it deals damage, right? And for the projectile itself, uh, what I've done was just given it a rotation speed of a minus 180 degrees so that when it flies out, it swirls around like that. I think that's about it. So you have a rigid body as well. The rigid body is there because you want the gravity to affect the X. So we have a rotation speed and then we just fire the X upwards. And then we let gravity do its job. This part is copyrighted, so I'm gonna voice over it. First off, just like the whip and knife weapons, the axe weapon fires a projectile whenever it cools down. Therefore, it inherits from the projectile weapon script. In the script, we will overwrite this function as shown here. Let's talk about get spawn offset first. To illustrate how the function works, basically, we are drawing a rectangle on the player and we will pick a random point inside the rectangle as the spawn offset of the projectile. The size of the rectangle is determined by the spawn variance property of the stats struct. The knife weapon spawn projectile in 8 directions, so the rotation of the rectangle has to follow the rotation of the knife. This is why we add a quaternion in front of the original function. However, the X always fly upwards, so there isn't a need to rotate the rectangle. Therefore, in the override function, we will remove the quaternion. The get spawn angle function basically gives us the rotation of the projectile when we instantiate it. Since we want the axe to fly upwards, we need to apply a spawn angle of 90 degree to the projectile. And because we want each subsequent axe to spawn further in front of the player, we want to modify the rotation of each subsequent axe as shown here. This is made possible by the formula here. If we ignore this part, you will see that it's equivalent to this line of code. This part is where we calculated the offset. For example, if we need to fire two projectiles, current attack count will start from 2, so the offset will be 2 minus 2 equals 0. Therefore, the spawn angle will be 90 minus 5 times 0 equals to 90. The offset of the second projectile will be 1, so the spawn angle will be 90 minus 5 times 1 equals to 85 degrees. Lastly, 
This part of the code ensures that the axe always spawn in front of the player. If the player is facing right, this will be 1. If the player is facing left, this will be negative 1, which increments the spawn angle instead of deducting it. So the spawn angle will be 95, 100 and so on. So once we get the X weapon set up, again we can create the weapon data for the X and then we are ready to go for the X. So let us just go to weapons, create, and then uh, weapon data, and we call this X. Behavior will be uh, X weapon. Go over to prefabs, uh, weapons, projectiles. X projectile, aura, and particle system will leave it empty. So the soul eater is just a glorified garlic, so it's gonna be pretty easy to create. It's just a garlic aura, but bigger and then with a different effect. So soul eater looks like this. Uh, you can check out the YouTube video on how to create the effect. So uh, same components as the garlic aura. The only difference is that it's just big. <laughs> it's really big, you know, because it affects the big area. Otherwise, uh, everything else is the same. Uh, so then once we have the Soul Eater Aura, the only thing we gotta do is just because it uses the Aura Weapon script, right? So we don't have to write any new scripts for the Soul Eater. So we just have to go to Scriptable Objects, Weapons, and then just create a new Soul Eater Weapon. So... Yeah. And uh, it'll be an Aura Weapon just like the Garlic. So then next level will be 1, Soul Eater, uh, Description, Garlic on steroids. Uh, aura will be our Soul Eater Aura prefab, right? Soul Eater. Spawn variance is zero because they're not applicable to auras. Uh, and then we just gotta grab the sets from, from the wiki. So it deals 20 damage, uh, area is big. Uh, damage is 20, maybe a variance of 5, right? Area would be just 1 because we've already made the effect big. Speed is zero, cooldown is 1 second. No projectile interval, knockback. I think it's just one, right? No knockback. Zero. Number is, uh, don't have to care about number. Piercing, we don't have to care about it because it's not projectile. Max instances, uh, it's not used at the moment. You just leave it at zero, it doesn't really matter. So we just gotta set the damage and damage variance, really, that's all about it. Uh, because level, only one level, so there's no linear growth, no random growth. And then, uh, let's just add a sprite to the soul eater. Find a random. Yeah, Soul Eater can just put this buckler, right? It's gonna use this as Soul Eater. So for the Soul Eater to work, uh, we will need to have our weapons set up as well. So the garlic needs to have evolution data added to it. Uh, over here it's already done. So then you just gotta name the evolution data, and then how does it activate? Does it activate automatically? Does it activate uh, only when you pick up a treasure chest? What does it consume? Does it consume weapons and passives or does it consume only weapons? Alright, so if you remember in Vampire Survivors, when you evolve your weapon, the passive stays but the weapon goes away. So then we will have to get our, our weapons to the appropriate level and then after that get a treasure chest and then this will get the weapon to evolve. So the evolution level here, I'm gonna set it to a lower value at the moment. So what this evolution level does is garlic needs to be level 8 to be able to evolve into soul eater. I'll reduce this to level 2. And then the catalyst over here will be a passive. And then the outcome, let's just assign a uh, soul eater here, level 1 soul eater. So for the passive, I'm just gonna very quickly create the Pamarola. Evolution data, same thing, soul eater. So we just have to repeat this in these instructions over here. Consumes only the weapons, evolution level, let's set it to 2. Uh, the catalyst over here would be the garlic, right? Checks, weapons, garlic. So I'll set the garlic to be level 2 as well and we can evolve this and then soul eater, level 1. And you also gotta set up the same evolution data and the garlic. Right? So the garlic over here, you gotta find your hammer roller and then assign it here and then uh, what's the evolution? So I'm just gonna set hammer roller and garlic to evolve both at level 2. So it's a lot easier for us to meet the conditions to evolve. And then once both sides are set, uh, we can just start playing the game. So once we get the requisite, uh, requisite items, then we can go and try to evolve my weapon. I can just head over to chest here, and then this gives me 
the soul eater. The scale of the soul eater seems to be off. Okay, my bad. Uh, I think the problem is that for the soul eater, I will have to set the area inside here as well. My bad, my bad. Set it too small so the soul eater was a little bit wet. So now we've got all the uh, requisites. See that? And then now you have very strong weapon and you just move around and destroy everything. So that's weapon evolution for you. Uh, if you set the stats up for the soul eater correctly, uh, make sure you give it a big area. Then the, the entire thing will work properly. And then uh, after you are done, of course, uh, just add the weapons to your to your inventory. So the next part, what we'll be doing is uh, we'll be revisiting the player stats. Because the passives, there are 17 player stats and we only implemented 6. So then we'll be implementing the rest of the stats and then tying them together with the weapons and we should have more or less a uh, weapon system that is done. After this part, I will not be covering any more weapons uh, in the main series entry. So if you want more weapons, uh, you can just post uh, your requests on the forums. Uh, if you've managed to create any weapons yourself, please share them in the forums as well. They'll be much appreciated. Thanks for joining. Uh, those of you who are here, I uh, really appreciate your support as always. Uh, if you have any questions, as usual, leave a comment anywhere in one of our videos or go to our forums uh, if you need code, reporting help, uh, but uh, I will try and answer you guys ASAP as usual. Thank you.